Well, I want to say good evening and welcome. I'm Eve Vogelstein, Great Talk President. And on behalf of the board and our partners, we'd like to thank you for being part of our new Maryland conversation series for the joy of talking and sharing ideas with the best minds around you. Okay, is it okay, Mike? Okay. Yeah, it sounds, huh? Okay. How's that? Does that sound better? Okay. Um, to our board, leaders in their own field, and our partners, eminent Maryland institutions from MICA, to public Maryland Public Television, Chesapeake Art Center, Blue Rock Productions and Studio, to Loyola University, the Maryland Science Center, Friends School of Baltimore, and of course, Morgan State University, and more. You deserve our most sincere thanks and profound appreciation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree. Tonight, I would like to thank our sponsor, the Zaff McKinney Group at Morgan Stanley, a gold sponsor, our silver sponsors for this evening, the Law Office of Diane Lee Davison, the Morgan Community Mile, and the Steer Company for their financial support. Your generous funding is greatly appreciated. I'd also like to thank the Mid-Atlantic Media, Style Magazine, The Strategic Factory, and WYPR for the printing and media support. And as always, tonight would not be possible without the help and the support of Greg Landry at Blue Rock Productions. Um, as you know, this is our final Great Talk panel conversation of the season. And I, I really hope that you've been enjoying what we have presented to you and will continue listening and questioning together for our next season of Great Talk. And once again, we're going to put together an exciting program covering a wide range of topics. You could stay connected with us through our website and our Facebook page to watch for our new season information. Tonight, please prepare your questions and save them for the Q&A period after the panel discussion. And everyone is invited to the meet and greet following the question and answers. Um, I would like to remind everybody to just silence their cell phones, please. On behalf of the great talk, I would like to extend a special thanks to Morgan State University for being our host this evening and for treating us to the refreshments later on. And to the board member, Ellis Brown, who helped coordinate tonight's talk. It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Don Terry Veal, Morgan State University Office of the President, Chief of Staff, who will introduce the members and moderator of the panel. Thank you very much. Good evening. It's always a great day to be at Morgan State University. Is that right, everybody? Yes, yes that's, that's what we love to hear. That's a great response. Thank you for that. We're so glad that you are here tonight with us. Um, events like this mean a lot to our institution. Dr. David Wilson, our president, would be here. But again, as you can imagine, he's the president of the institution. And he's always busy, um, of course, handling Morgan's affairs. I said that because whenever there's an opportunity to, for us to bring individuals on our campus and talk a little bit about our institution and support the community of Baltimore and the community of Maryland, he supports that 100%. So we are glad you are here and welcome. Uh, just a little bit about Morgan. Morgan um, recently, uh, perhaps as, as of last year, has been designated by the state of Maryland as the preeminent public urban research institution, the preeminent public urban research institution university in the state of Maryland. And we are very, very excited and proud of that designation. That says a lot about the state of Maryland, but it ultimately says everything about Morgan. Last year, uh, we experienced our 150th anniversary. So we've been here for 150 years, and so we have a lot to feel proud about. We have a lot to look forward to as well, and we are hoping and we are planning for the next 150 years to be even that much more exciting than the last 150 years at Morgan. About a year or so ago, 
Uh, we were also designated as a national treasurer by the National Historic Preservation Society. Now, and when we talk about that as us as a national treasury, we're not just talking about one campus here or one campus there, like you may have experienced at, perhaps I could say this, Howard University and, uh, and perhaps some of the other universities around the country, Brown University. Um, but our entire campus has been designated as a national treasurer. And we are the only institution in the country with such a designation. And of course, a lot has to do with the vision of our president and of course, those that have come before him by making our new development sync, to have our new development to synchronize itself with the previous historic developments as well. And they've looked at that and recognized that it's that kind of forward thinking that makes a difference for us and it distinguishes us in the state of Maryland and around the world. And, and so um, I would also just say finally that um, recently we had just done a, an economic impact study and many around the state and of course around the country, universities that is, like doing economic impact studies, but no one knows what they will come up with. So it's always a drum roll as you hold your breath. But in this particular case, we did both. We drum rolled and held our breath. And as of um, a few weeks ago, our economic impact for, on the state of Maryland is $1 billion. And thank you for that. And so a few weeks ago, I was in the city of New Orleans uh, with a number of universities with our vice president for research and economic development, who's a former director of NIST. And this individual, and of course the universities there were talking about what they need to do and how they need to begin thinking about their future for their universities. And we were so proud to say that everything that they are planning to do that Morgan has already done. And um, get a load of this, guys. That's my hometown, I'm from New Orleans. So they kept saying, come on, this guy from Morgan, he can't stay in this room any longer. Um, and so they were, they were perhaps considering taking away my birthrights um, from the city of New Orleans. But I was so proud to talk about that because we're making great strides here at Morgan and we're having a great impact on the state of Maryland. And within that $1 billion impact that we just talked about, 60% of that impact is consistent in supporting the city of Baltimore. So that's Morgan State University. Having said that, um, I would now like to, of course, introduce um, our distinguished panel here. We have Lafayette Gilchrist. Um, Lafayette, so um, what I like about Morgan in Baltimore, of course, being from New Orleans, is that we have so much in common, and we talked about that a little earlier tonight, with um, the city of Baltimore, that is the city of New Orleans. Because prior to Morgan, I was at, um, the university uh, at Auburn University for 15 years. And um, our president, Dr. Wilson, was the vice president there. And of course, I knew him. And that, that's one reason why I was excited to come here. Of course, I understood why he made the decision to come here in the first place after being here. But nevertheless, we had this agency and we did a lot of statewide supports for the state of Alabama. And, and so when I was there for about, hmm, about three weeks, so my, the, the gentleman who initially was over the area that where I worked, he said, Don Terry, he said, so what you need to do is to go to um, Lafayette, Alabama, and if, if you're comfortable with that, you know, do it, and we, we, you know, just if you need some help, let me know. But of course, when you knew you wanted to be you're excited, and you want, you want to impress your boss, right? So I wanted to impress him and impress him, so I looked on the map, and I could not find Lafayette, Alabama. I said, well, what a minute here. And so I said, you sure you pronouncing it right? And he was determined that it was Lafayette, Alabama. And so finally, um, I, I gave in. I said, Jim, I said, I give up. I, I didn't want to tell you this, but I can't find Lafayette, Alabama. He said, Don Terry, it's right here. I said, that's, that's Lafayette, right? <laughs> so in, in, in Baltimore, we pronounced it Lafayette. And that's what I'm accustomed to. So there's so many things that remind me of home. And of course, Lafayette, Gilhurst, Gilchrist, Gilchrist is an acclaimed American jazz pianist and composer. We have Wendell Patrick, who's a musician and hip hop producer. Susan Chang, who's a classical pianist and co-founder of the Concert Truck. And Aaron Henkin, who's our moderator. 
and who's a radio producer with WYPR. Can we give this group a round of applause, please? Thank you for being here. And now I'll turn the panel on to our colleague here, Mr. Henkin. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introductions. Uh, and thank you guys for being here as well. Um, and, and, and really, thank you guys uh, for being here. There's, it's a Tuesday evening. Uh, this is a, uh, an intimate but uh, esteemed crowd as I look around. Mm -hmm. Uh, the brain power here is impressive. Um, and you guys could have been doing anything this evening, checking your Facebook feeds and looking at your phones. We're here uh, having a, a human moment together, and I, I salute you for that. Um, this, I always like to remind myself every day of the words of uh, David Isay, who's the guy who uh, s founded StoryCorps. He says, uh, listening is an act of love. And I never take it for granted when folks show up to hear each other's stories. So thank you sincerely for being here. Um, you've got a great panel here, uh, very talented musicians, all three piano players. I made sure to shake everybody's hand very carefully uh, today. Uh, and uh, so we'll, the way we'll structure this evening, I imagine, is um, I'll uh, moderate a conversation with our three guests here for um, uh, say 45 minutes or so, and then I know uh, folks in the audience have thoughts and questions, that, and I welcome you to get involved then uh, in the conversation for some Q&A. Um, and uh, there's a lot I want to cover with you guys. Uh, we have many different directions we can take this conversation. Um, we can talk a little bit about um, how you think creatively, not only about your own music, but about your uh, careers and how you make ends meet as working musicians. You're all great musicians, which is rare. You're working musicians, which is even more rare. Uh, and we'll talk about how you make that happen. I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about technology uh, this evening, uh, evolutions in technology and, and audience expectations that come along with digital platforms that uh, offer music essentially for free. Um, we can talk about genres, how those genres mutate and cross-pollinate. Um, but first, here, here's my first question. I'd like for each of you to take a, just a couple of minutes and just to give, I thought it'd be an interesting way to give folks a sense of um, who you are and, and sort of how you hustled to uh, uh, make a life as a working musician. Let me each tell, have you, let me have each of you um, just tell me how busy you've been in the past, say, 48 hours, and what you've been doing career-wise uh, to, um, to, to, as far as your uh, professional uh, music careers go. Just to get a sense of your daily life uh, as a working musician. Lafayette, you're sitting closest to me, so I'm gonna let you start here. I'll give you the microphone. Let's see, last 48 hours? Well, last 48 hours, um Calling musicians, organizing rehearsals, uh, writing little arrangements and, and tweaking the music for the individuals that are going to be in the um, <coughs> for individuals that are going to be, you know, involved in the uh, in the gig we have on Thursday. So primarily, uh, just wrapped up with that and. Uh, just uh, checking emails for the details on the stage arrangement, and, uh, instrumentation, that kind of thing. So that's been the last f roughly 48 hours. And, uh, and I still practice. I still practice about, I get in about four to five hours a day. Still, I can do it. Hello, can you? I'm so jealous you get it four to five hours in a day. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of my last 48 hours and I've, I've, I can't, it's all a wash. Um, I, I practiced a little bit today uh, for a gig that I have coming up later this month. Um, I wrote a lot of thank you cards, handwritten uh, from a fundraising concert that I did recently. Um, I taught to two new students of mine who are five. Uh, <laughs> They're very, very cute. Um, and yesterday was Monday, right? <laughs> today's, today's Tuesday. I'm sure I did a lot of other things in between now and then that I can't even, I can't even remember. <laughs> um, so 
in the last 48 hours, I've taken uh, two naps. Um, each nap was about one hour long. Um, I also um, have the pleasure of uh, co-creating a show with that gentleman on the end, with Aaron Henkin, uh, which is Out of the Blocks. And the latest episode came out um, today, which meant that uh, much of yesterday I was writing music um, for that, which is uh, where the one hour power nap came in. Um, and um, besides that, earlier today, um, in between naps, I was at uh, a school doing a residency with, um, uh, I guess the popular term these days is at-risk youth, but uh, they were just wonderful kids, um, uh, high school kids that uh, I was introducing to music and technology. Um, and then also, uh, I also pra managed to practice a little bit. I didn't get four hours, maybe maybe an hour. Uh, um, and then uh, taking care of administrative details, whether returning emails or um, uh, just you know contacting, following up with with people about uh, business business ends. It's interesting to hear these accounts because it sounds like the accounts of three independent business owners. Uh, you are your own business operation in addition to being your own sort of uh, creative product, uh, which I imagine, let me, let, let me, I, I wanted to have you begin that way to sort of give a concrete example, but let me, let me now have you each maybe speak in broader terms a little bit about your, uh, your musical focus, your, um, the way you sort of apply your musical talents, um, and, um, and just talk about how important it is to think, uh, creatively, not only about your music, but about how you make a living for yourself as a musician. Lafayette, you um, are a recording artist and a, a, a concert performer. I know you have a demanding schedule. Susan, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the concert truck and the innovation behind that. And Wendell, um, you have got so many irons in the fire. I wonder if uh, you, know, you might uh, talk just a little bit about the juggling act and all the different sort of applications that you find as a musician for your creative talents. Um, and I, I started with Lafayette last time. I'll let, I'll let you start here, Wendell. Sure. Um, so uh, that's a very good question. Um, uh, so personally, in terms of what I do musically, uh, I'm originally a classical pianist. Um, and uh, that has sort of morphed into um, <laughs> doing lots of different things. And I'm sure over the course of the evening that it'll, I'll probably have a chance to talk more about like why that happened or how, but um, uh, so now uh, I, I am a university professor. I teach at Johns Hopkins University and um, at Peabody uh, Conservatory. And I taught um, prior to that at Loyola University for 11 years teaching um, piano and music history and music theory. Um, but I also do, uh, you know, I consider myself very much a, a solo artist. I have five albums uh, that I put out uh, where I played everything on every album um, electronically. And, um, you know, that was very much, you know, the, the production stuff just sort of started out as a, as a hobby, just something I was doing to sort of um, pass the time when I wasn't practicing classical or jazz piano. And that, you know, sort of turned into this uh, secondary career with a whole other name uh, that I use. Um, and, um, you know, putting out my own work then led to other people coming to me to ask me to produce things um, for them. That's actually how uh, Aaron and I met. Um, Aaron had interviewed me on a previous show of his called The Signal about my uh, original music that I made. And um, when it came time, uh, when he had the idea for Out of the Blocks, he actually reached out to me and asked if uh, he could use some of the music from my albums. And um, I thought of that as a, sort of an art, art, artistic uh, opportunity. And I said, well, instead of using some of the original music that's already been created, what if I were to score each episode with an uh, you know, original soundtrack? And so um, you know, basically, I've, I've used my skill set um, and sort of been open to it growing and taking me in other career directions. Um, sometimes not really knowing that that's what would happen, just sort of exploring an artistic opportunity, and then it uh, sort of leads to something else. And so it does. Um, there's definitely a lot of uh, juggling that goes on, and um, you know that has led to photography and, and other things. And um, 
so it's definitely a, you know, a, a, a challenge to sort of um, have things that you take on that are appealing, um, that you know, will ideally offer some sort of financial reward, but also balancing that with things that may offer no reward initially um, at all, but knowing that that will sort of further you uh, down, down the line. For example, when Aaron first approached me about Out of the Blocks, and I said, you know, that I'd like to score uh, an episode, the first thing Aaron said is, well, you know, we have no money, there's no money, and I, just, I said, well, you know, I, typical musician response, I was like, I don't care, uh, I'll do it anyway. And, um, but knowing that it would, you know, lead to, to, to other things. So it's definitely a, a juggling act for myself, and I'm sure for the other folks on stage as well. Okay, thanks, Wendell. Susan? Would you mind repeating the initial yeah, question? Yeah, so <laughs> I, I, I wonder if, yeah, just talk a little bit about um, how you have th um, thought creatively about how uh, about not only about the, the music that mm -hmm. you're making and performing, but about how you're, um, you, like for example, uh, specifically, I wonder if you might talk about a, a wonderful innovation uh, that you and your partner came up with, um, which has brought you a lot of well-deserved uh, attention uh, and um, which has given you an opportunity to, to see a lot of the country. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, so I, I'm a classical pianist, and I, I got into it because I love classical music a lot. Um, and uh, so when you're in conservatory, it's, it's sort of this uh, very intense pressure cooker hub of just classical music, and everyone uh, in conservatory is very you know well versed in classical music and uh, and it's so intense that sometimes it's hard to meet people uh, outside of that world <laughs> and so um, as I got older in my training and I I um, was performing more and I was meeting more more people I was noticing that not everybody really knows and loves classical music as much as I do and um, and they they're always telling us in school oh it's dying and or it's on life support and we need to figure out how to uh, reinvigorate the love for classical music. I don't know if I agree that it's, it's dying, but um, I definitely was interested in finding a, a creative way to make my work relevant. Um, and so uh, the idea actually came from my partner. Um, he was traveling with his grandfather and uh, they would stop every now and then at a church so that he could practice. Um, and when he practiced, people were, were very curious about the music that he was playing because it's really great music. And they, uh, they would come in and they would listen. And he had this idea of having some kind of mobile concert hall that would go to where the people are rather than expect them to come to the hall. Um, and so then he pitched this idea to me and I, I thought he was kind of crazy, but <laughs> um, I, I, after that I watched this movie called Chef. I don't know if anybody's familiar with it, but it's uh, yeah, <laughs> starring Jean Favreau. Um, and it's uh, about um, a very popular chef who, who quits his restaurant and buys a food truck and he gets to see the country because of that. And that was something that sounded really interesting to me. Um, so I started thinking about it more and then we, we made it happen. Yeah. Not a food truck. No, not to yet. Explain what, <laughs> it, explain what your setup is. <laughs> so we, uh, we were donated a 16 foot box truck and uh, we basically carved a hole into the side, the driver's side of it and we stuck doors on. So it opens up that way <laughs> and um, Inside, it's a stage. There's lights, there's sound equipment, um, there's a piano for, for me to play on and for my partner to play on. Um, and we just can roll up wherever you can park a truck and we can open up and we can give a performance to whoever's there. Tell me about, uh, give folks a sense of where you've driven this truck. Sure. Like how far, you've, this, how far <laughs> your road trips take you. Well, the, uh, we originally began in Columbia, South Carolina because... Um, both of us are, are from the South, and um, we did a small tour of the city there. Um, since then, we've brought the truck up to Baltimore because now we're based here. Um, we've done some, uh, a few concerts in the area, in the Baltimore, D.C. area. Uh, last summer, we were invited by Minnesota Public Radio to do um, a 
three-day residency with them. It was a tour of greater Minnesota. And so that was very intense. It was like kind of a play and go situation where we were sometimes in three cities in one day. Um, but it was, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, before, uh, uh, before our event began this evening, uh, Lafayette was asking Susan about this truck and he was listening very intently. And after she sort of explained the scenario, he said, but you sell food out of the truck as well, right? <laughs> No, not yet. Not yet. Not, not yet. yet. We've 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 been talking about it. But the, ge we, we the gears are turning. Yet, okay. So. <laughs> very good. Uh, all right. I'll let you uh, hand the microphone over to uh, Lafayette, and uh, uh, I'll just put the question again to you uh, this way, Lafayette. Just um, I think when you uh, sort of explained your last forty-eight hours, we got a sense of um, administratively a little bit about what it means to be a band leader. Um, Talk to me about how um, how you decide how, uh, about how you decide your schedule, about how you decide your venues, about how you decide your how you pace recordings versus live performances, and about how you've been in this you've been at this for a while. And just tell me, give a sense of a little bit about that journey and what it's taught you along the way. Well, that's been that's been bumpy uh, in terms of just. Uh, staying organized and 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 staying to to schedule, because um, you know I started out I started out my I mean this may sound a little mundane a little bit boring, but I I kind of started out with the idea that I would teach students maybe three days out of the week, and um, I would have a, a day for composition, and then uh, the weekends for gigging. And that's how I would, uh, that's how I live. And for the most part, I've been able to pull that, but the thing is the the, the teaching experience, and, and, and Suzanne and Wendell can probably relate to this, it, 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 it adds something different to your musicianship. You know, when you have to, when you have to explain, uh, when you have to explain something to a seven, year old or an eight year old, then that's another, it, it makes you think about what you what you may do automatically and take for granted. It makes you really like rethink it from scratch. And I found that's made me a better musician and it's made me, I've always had a good rapport with kids, so it's made me a good teacher. Um, but it swelled up my student roster to the point where now I'm teaching Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, and Sundays. Oh. Yeah, so it's uh, it's it's gotten. I, I mean, I'm enjoying the experience, but it has it has presented a little a little problem with with uh, with uh, the scheduling and stuff. So that's just something that I'm currently working through. Now. That's obviously a dependable source of income. Um, and and one that then supports your more personal creative endeavors. Um, but then the irony is that it's getting in the way of the time and energy that you have to do that creative work. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a balancing. It's just a balancing thing. It, 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 it'll come together. You've made it, wor you've made it work pretty remarkably so far. Um, Talk to me about when, and I'll have each of you sound off on this. Rewind for me and talk to me about when you were uh, seven or eight years old. Like, how, tell me each how you kind of came to uh, the piano keyboard. Um, and I, I know that Susan and Wendell both started off playing classical piano. Was that your experience as well? No, no, um, no. I'm self-taught largely. So, um, tell me the story of the first time you remember sitting down at a piano. Oh man, I I was uh, a freshman student at at uh, UMBC University of Maryland in, in Baltimore, and what had happened was uh, I was uh, I was there for summer school uh, classes, and the summer school uh, uh, English class they held were in the Fine Arts Building, and. Uh, they happened to, and they left the doors open. So I wandered into the recital hall one day, 
And I sat down at a, a nine foot Steinway grand piano and uh, I decided I liked that. And you were just, you were self-taught from there. I mean, imagine you, you found recordings that you liked and sort of took cues from. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a long story, but I was about, I was about 17. So that's a different experience, I imagine, than yours, Susan. Talk about your uh, introduction to the piano, uh, sort of who, who uh, inspired or pushed you toward that, and, and just sort of what it was like for you to get acquainted with the, with the piano keys. Well, when I, when I was young, unfortunately, my, my story is not very inspiring. <laughs> um, I was made to play the piano by my parents because all my other friends were doing it, and so um, they were very competitive, <laughs> so I was also very competitive. Um, and uh, I didn't really start to love it until I started discovering some of the, the great works that I really love when I, when I started to actually listen to a lot of Chopin and, and Beethoven and Rachmaninoff. And um, I felt sort of the power of that, that kind of music and then to understand that it was possible for me to communicate that. Um, that's when I started to actually really work hard and to really love it. Um, I had a really wonderful teacher in South Carolina um, who, who really, I think, pushed me to not only have great quality of playing, but to really find out uh, what it is that I have to say. And she, she was just very unyielding about that. And um, you don't always, you're not always able to access that, but when you do, it's, it's just an incredibly special thing. Um. You're an interesting case, Susan, uh, here in terms of our panel. Um, you're sitting in between two musicians who uh, spend a lot of time uh, composing their own work, <laughs> right? Do you do your own composing, or are you very focused on uh, mastering and performing uh, repertoires? Um, not really, not yet. Um, I, I did recently do a transcription of something, so I'm hoping that will be a gateway into composing. Um, I would love to explore that in the future. Talk to me then briefly before we pass the microphone to Wendell about um, the creative latitude that you do have in interpreting uh, a piece, a composed piece, right. um, and your the sort of the space that you have for self-expression um, as a concert pianist. Sure. Um, Wow, that's a that's a really tough question. <laughs> uh, there, a lot of people do say, you know, the notes are written out for you. That's it's not really how how are you being creative, right? But I think of it a lot like it's acting in a way. You know, you have a script, um, but it's your job to make that script or the score, in my case, come alive and to really um, understand the story behind it and to be able to sell sell that story to an audience and to convince them of what that is. And um, so I think it actually does take a lot of um, knowledge of the composer, the style, but also a lot of digging for your own voice and how you want to say that. That, um, that. that is a very creative process, I think. That's a beautiful analogy, and one I never heard before, like oh, acting. Yeah. <laughs> Method acting, maybe. Is a little think bit about maybe. a horrible memory before you're going to play it. <laughs> Um, all right, let me, let me have you pass the microphone to Wendell. Uh, and Wendell, let me have you uh, say a few words to our audience about your uh, piano playing uh, origins, uh, the kind of piano you started playing and played for many years, and, and sort of how that evolved. Sure. Um, well, so my introduction to music was, um, I think, probably not unlike Susan's. Um, I, you know, when I was three years old, my parents noticed that I had. Uh, some m musical affinity, and my, I had a sister that's a year and a half older than I am, and um, she put her in piano lessons, and I would accompany her uh, when she would go for her lessons, and I would sort of sit on the sideline and answer the, all the teacher's questions, and so the teacher was like, I want to teach him, um, but I was, you know, super shy at the time, so um, she plied me with uh, candy for about a month, and um, then I started taking lessons, and uh, uh, I also had a, you know, she was a wonderful teacher and um, really, uh, you know, I, I loved going to my lessons every week and um, was, uh, you know, always felt challenged and encouraged. And um, as I grew up, uh, as a young boy, I was, you know, entering a lot of competitions and um, around a lot of other um, talented kids. Um, 
and progressed very rapidly. Um, and then when I was about 14, uh, at, at that point in time, my family had moved to Jamaica, and I uh, came back for boarding school, and um, was just sort of you know disenchanted with um, sort of the constant you know hours of practice. And I had a lot of other interests. I played a lot of sports, and um, so I just you know decided to take a break for uh, you know about six months, and that break turned into uh, a four-year break. And um, uh, over that time, I, you know, sort of experimented with other kinds of music, and but didn't really play the piano at all. Um, and uh, when I came back to it, uh, I, you know, developed a very uh, strong relationship with my teacher in, in college. Uh, and at that point, uh, my relationship to music, I think, shifted because it was now something that I, I, I had always loved music, but um, as opposed to being something that sort of I had to do because you know it was being paid for every month or every week. Um, now I just sort of had this real passion um, for it. Um, and so graduated from college, went to, went to music school. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, it was a, a, around that time right after music school when I sort of got interested in, in producing and making music. And I had no idea what I was doing, where to start, and just bought like you know, a couple really small pieces of equipment and would make these like you know, sort of silly little beats that I was amused with with no intention of having them uh, you know, go anywhere outside of my little apartment. Um, but I uh, sort of became obsessed with it and would use the gear that I had until I sort of felt like I couldn't do any more with it and I would sell it and get something else. And um, So, you know, I went from like this one little, uh, you know, small keyboard and, and recorder to now I've got this, like if anyone who's, who's come over to my place, I've just got like gadgets, you know, everywhere, um, some of which I've held on for nostalgic reasons. But uh, yeah, everything that I've done as far as music production um, was all uh, just sort of learned by um, trial and error, but on the foundation uh, of the musical knowledge um, that I learned um, from when I was very young. Your story is an interesting story of adaptation as well, because you you ended up you, your your sort of shift in genres and focus was the was the result of a limitation, a physical limitation as well. I wonder if you might tell that story. Sure. Um, well, so it wasn't so much a, a, a shift in genre um, because of a limitation, per se. Um, it was actually probably more drastic than that, even, in that, um, so around 2004, 2005, um, at that point, I was performing um, almost exclusively classical music. And I, was, I played jazz and improv improvised concerts as well, but not that much. Um, my focus was on classical music, and I was in uh, I had just performed in Bolivia playing a Mozart concerto with an uh, orchestra there. And, um, and uh, after that, I felt like something was a little bit wrong with my hand, or it just felt like it was tired, you know? And um, I'm sure, uh, you know, both of you at some point have probably had, like, you know, fatigue, or maybe you, you, you pull a little something, and, you know, you just rest for a week or so and can get back to it. And um, so uh, I, you know, I rested and, um, then played a uh, had a performance in, in Italy and then felt like something very similar. Um, so again, you know, just rested for a couple of weeks and then when I started playing again, um, I noticed that I couldn't actually control um, the index finger on my left hand. Like, it wasn't actually. I I just noticed something was wrong. I actually can't say I didn't. I noticed that I couldn't control it, but something was just a little bit wrong. And then it got progressively worse over the course of a month, pretty quickly. Um, so I went to see a doctor thinking that maybe I had some sort of like pulled ligament and um, uh, you know so I remember he took me up to a piano this is at the um, musicians uh, clinic at um, uh, the hospital up over there uh, close to Hopkins um, no not UMBC yes Un uh, Union Memorial um, thank you and um, so I remember he watched me play and then he was like okay well let's go back down to the um, examination room, and I remember I was in the elevator with him and two nurses, and like no one was saying anything. And I was just like, so I said, um, you guys are kind of making me nervous without saying it, because you're not saying anything. And I just remember they all sort of went, hmm. And uh, so then uh, basically I was diagnosed with um, focal dystonia, which is a neurological disorder um, that affects, can affect, um, anyone really, but uh, it's, there's something called musician's dystonia, which pianists sometimes get, um, when players can get it in their mouths. Um, those of you that are familiar with uh, Dilbert, the 
comic ship. Uh, he had it in his hand, so he had trouble drawing. Um, and basically, so I lost control of this particular digit, essentially, and um, which was really devastating. I, I, I you know, did all these tests. There's no cure for it. There, are, there is treatment that sometimes works. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, it didn't work for me. Um, uh, but I had surgery as well and couldn't play the piano at all for, for seven months. And um, so during you know, that sort of two-year period where I was wrestling with this, I, and not being able to play, um, sort of this hobby of mine, this you know, little beat making thing, was something that I just did more of just because I just couldn't do anything music, musical or creative. Um, so I wasn't really thinking of it in terms of like, well, this is what I'm gonna have to do career-wise. I was really sort of holding out hope that um, you know, I would be able to return to physical form um, and was just kind of doing something to just like stay sane, really, um, and really you know, to, to battle the depression that I was feeling. Um, and so I just started to show some of the little things I was making to people, and obviously over time they were getting, they'd gotten better, and um, friends were like, what are you do gonna do with this stuff? And I was just like, nothing, That's, it's just for me. And they were like, no, no, you should really, you should really do something with this. And um, so I remember I, at some point I had enough things to put together an album, um, and uh, you know, I sent it off to uh, some magazine, um, some national magazine, for just to see if they might be interested in writing something about it. And, and they loved it, and um, they wrote a, a really great review, and um, then the album came out, and so like little by little, this this thing just started to sort of work for me, and um, you know, it wasn't until that and several other things happened, and um, that I you know started to realize like, oh, okay, this is actually work, like I'm actually sort of doing this other thing that I hadn't really thought about doing at all, um, and over the course of the next few years, uh, I was able to sort of to work to get past this um, neurological issue. So it's sort of like, you know, I came out on the other end with like these two careers sort of side by side. So um, Susan, the case of one less uh, classical musician. Uh, no, he, Wendell still plays. Uh, he actually, you, you've managed to master, sort of psychologically master the focal dystonia to a degree as well. Um, let, uh, Susan, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to you and, and have you go back to something you uh, made mention of uh, a few minutes ago about this idea that classical music is an endangered species. Um, uh, say a little more about that. Is that true or not? And if so, um, is, is this just a case of sort of Darwinian musical evolution? Uh, or is this, uh, uh, you know, a tradition that... Uh, you know, actively needs to be preserved or modified somehow. You've probably done a lot of thinking about this. I definitely have done a lot of thinking about this. Um, I, I'm not sure that I, I really know the answer to that because there are definitely people on both camps who feel very strongly about, about it. Um, uh, some people, you know, you look at sales and you look at um, empty concert halls and you look at orchestras folding and that would be an indicator that it is dying. Um, but at the same time, a lot of people in classical music say, well, it's, it's always kind of been like this. It's always been um, sort of uh, on life support. <laughs> um, well, I, I think that throughout history, though, classical music has always had some form of patronage. Um, and so right now, we're in sort of this era of a market-driven society. Um, and uh, so the patronage for that is not quite as clear as it was before, where it would be like um, an aristocracy or a church or something that was very clearly funding the, the making of this music. Um, so I, I, think, I think of it more personally, and I think that each musician probably has a different relationship with that question. So for me to answer that, I, for myself, I had to just look at my own experiences um, with where, just even starting with where I grew up and the kind of people I knew. And really the only relationship that I can have with, with showing this kind of music is founded in that. Um, so um, that's, that's really, I guess, what's more important to me than, than answering that question, if that makes sense. It sounds like what you're saying is that... Um Part of the equation is making sure you cultivate a, some sort of functional relationship with your audience. Right, that's true. Um, 
And I think that that you have to sort of know your audience who you're playing for, and you have to figure out how you contextualize this music so that you can make it relevant, so that they that they can understand um, why it is relevant. It's like uh, learning Shakespeare, you know. <laughs> um, and I think. Um, so I guess it's, I, I wouldn't say that it's dying, but I do think that maybe it needs to be recontextualized um, with every generation that it's brought back in. Let me have you pass the microphone to Lafayette, and uh, let me put this question to you. Um, talk about your relationship with your audience, um, uh, who, who they are, how you've um, sort of grown and reached out uh, and built uh, a group of people around you who... Um, know what you're about, appreciate what you're doing, uh, how you stay connected with them um, through uh, not just the recordings you put out, but um, your, your live performances. Well, um, I could say a little bit more about, uh, I'd like to say a little bit more about just how I came, came to, to, to music because it, it'll, it'll help to answer, answer your question. But... Um, you know, once I kind of discovered that I, uh, that music would 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 maybe offer me um, a path, then then I began to try to learn uh, as much as I could. So the intervening years uh, it consisted of um, uh, pestering other musicians to show me things, uh, going out to clubs. Uh, so which means I had to learn how to go in the, in the city, was, which was not a, really a problem for me because I, I was raised in, in Washington D.C. So going to Baltimore City was not that that wasn't a problem, you know. I, uh, and hanging in the clubs uh, that wasn't a problem. So that that's what I spent a lot of time doing, and I learned a lot uh, from uh, different musicians on the ground who were performing. So I was the guy for a lot of years standing over whoever the keyboard player or the piano player was. I was the guy standing over his shoulder, you know, mm -hmm. and trying to check out what he's doing. And also teaching myself to read music and write music at the same time. Because I was a student at UMBC, I had access to a lot of stuff. I had access to the library. Uh, I had access to other students in the music department. And so I just began to make friends and use resources. And the most important, the most important friendship that I made on that campus was with the cleaning staff, the people to scrub the toilets, mop the floors, because they would they had keys to everything. <laughs> so I would practice. I'd spend my my evenings whenever the cleaning staff was there. I spent my evenings practicing on concert Steinway grand pianos, man, you know. So um it's important to know the right people. Yes. 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 And that that's something my grandmother taught me when I when I first went off to college. She said she said, "Make sure you know who the people are who scrub the toilets, and clean the floors, and empty the garbage because they're the people that know a lot more than uh, uh, certainly. Oh man, they—they. They, they, I, I got, you know, I, I got access to uh, musical training, and I or some uh, pianos, and I got, uh, and I, I got uh, a, a good deal of life schooling as well. Um, now, having said that, um, the. Uh, Say your question again. The qu so, uh, talk to me about uh, sort of where you are now in terms of um, oh, your audience and audience your relationship with your audience now. Yeah, that that came that came about hanging in the clubs and sitting in jam sessions, uh, getting to know uh, different musicians and uh, coax uh, being able to to um, get gigs and and coax uh, musicians. Into uh, into playing, and what had happened? What happened with me, which is why I go back to the to the UMBC experience, is uh, there was a lady 
who's working in the uh, promotions office at UMBC, who used to uh, happen to hear me play. And she started hiring me for uh, different events to, to play the background and stuff. And so um, the going rate for working musicians, local working musicians, is somewhere between 80 and $100 a man per, per gig, which is pretty low. Um, so what had happened was that I, when Ramona would hire me, uh, and I, maybe I shouldn't put her name out there, but she was a very nice lady. And, and when she would hire me uh, for, the, for the gigs, I would have a budget of like $1,500. You know, and being a college kid, I just thought, okay, we all split the money even. So that got me some of the best musicians in the city to work with me. Just just because I had I had a, I was known as the as the buck fifty kid, you know, because all my I, I could get I could get, I could hire the cats and everybody knew they would make a buck fifty at least, you know. And sometimes two hundred if the budget you know, if it if it was in the budget. And so I literally began a, a, a process of paying musicians to come and do the gigs and subsequently run the gigs because they, they were more, way more experienced than I was. So um, I didn't have any problem with, with being the leader and then when it's time to play the music, I knew my place. <laughs> you know, you, you, you'd be a side man, you sit in and you learn. So I learned from older, more experienced musicians. That's a beautiful story. So you, you were, you were kind of like the team manager, but then you would put the other guys in the spotlight when it came time for the performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's what the volcanoes kind of became. Yeah, yeah. When that, when that evolved, um, you know, uh, I don't know, I was always more comfortable as a, as a player playing. I need people, you know, I need people um, to play with, play off of, you know, it's, 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 it's fun. I can do solo gigs, but even if I'm doing a solo gig, I'm, I'm, the left hand is somebody, the right hand is somebody, and it, they're, you know, they're interchanging all the time. So I, I, I've always needed that. And, and so in terms of growing an audience and stuff, um, I don't know, the, the performances, the performances are infectious, but most importantly, the performances are sincere, you know, and, and I think people connect with that. And so my audiences over the years have been a little bit of everybody, young, old, uh, various ethnicities, race, what have you. Um, the music is open. Beautifully put. I promise you I'm not checking my messages. I'm just checking the time to make sure we honor our, okay. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, monopolize these guys with one last quick question and then I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to, uh, to you guys for your thoughts and, and questions. This is my last, uh, last question. You guys can go down the line. Um, what is your, what, what's your uh, most embarrassing musical guilty pleasure? <laughs> no, you got the mic. You good. <laughs> he started with me last time. There's rep I know there's reputations on the line oh, here, so man. this you is a safe space. Yep. Oh man. <laughs> Guiltiest musical pleasure. Oh man. I can take you off. Yeah, please, please. All right, so this is gonna sound really diplomatic, but um, so, uh, I, I don't know that anybody should, uh, I mean, you guys should answer for yourselves, but, um, I think the idea of a guilty musical pleasure comes more from, um, sort of general overall perception, right? And so, um, for me, right, like I, I like all, all kinds of music, um, which also means that I, I dislike all kinds of music, right? So there's stuff that I like of a particular genre and other, and other things that I that I don't like. Um, and I think, you know, sort of the more that I, I uh, think creatively in terms of making music, um, I think about it more in terms of like, how does somebody combine uh, the different elements, whether it's, you know, pitch, rhythm, uh, speed, 
you know, my, you know changing keys, lyrical content. Um, and uh, you know, the more I think about that, the more I think that there's gen there's genuinely something that somebody could find to like about anything. Right? And so, um, just a couple weeks ago, I was in uh, Beijing and I had an opportunity to perform there. Um, and I did a, um, a performance using turntables and electronics. Um, um, I was doing you know, finger drumming on beat making machines, beatboxing. Um, but the show that I did it on was actually a um, hardcore metal show. And so it was like, I, I did my set and then there was like these three, you know, screaming bands, you know? So like, I say that and like, I see some of you all smiling already, right? Because like, we all have sort of this preconception and it really was that, but, um, but it was really good, right? And so I don't know that I would ever like, just sort of sit down and, and purposefully listen to any of those bands, but they're um, sort of, you know, as uh, Lafayette was saying, their, their authenticity and the way that they delivered it was compelling enough that if I can sort of like remove myself from like the, you know, the feeling of wh where that smirk comes from, which is really sort of like an initial dismissiveness, then I can find something there that I, um, you know, really like. Um, that said, my guilty pleasure, uh, um, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know. No, but that's what I'm saying. I don't, I don't know that I actually don't don't know that I have one. I'm saying I'm saying, but you can't have a guilty pleasure having laid it out like that. But, but yeah, that, that's you know my what point. I mean? That's what I, that's my point. So um, when I said my guilty pleasure, I said it kind of tongue in cheek because, yeah. um, you know, uh, yeah. I, that, so that that's my answer. Beth. <laughs> um, so I think. Like I, I really agree with that, and I think a lot of it is actually has very little to do with the music itself, and rather sort of the branding around the music. Um, like this kind of person listens to this kind of music, so I feel like this is a guilty pleasure because I'm not that kind of person. Um, and actually, with the concert track, that that is something that we're trying to to tear down a little bit because a lot of times a certain kind of person listens to classical music, um, and I, I don't believe that. So um, uh, so as far as a guilty pleasure, um, having just said that, I also fell into the trap, and the first thing that I thought of was Taylor Swift, uh, 1989. Um, there are some, some tracks on that album that I, I really enjoy. Um, yeah, I know, it's not, they're good songs, right? Well, and even like <laughs> you know, the point that you just made about like how um, like the idea of a certain type of individual listening to a certain kind of right. music. I mean, that's you know like all three of us are you know professional, well-regarded musicians. And by the way, I, I always tell people on panels like I highly recommend if you haven't already, like when you go home, like check all of us out, right? Like listen to everything that li listen to things that we make, just so you really get a sense. Um, but you know Taylor Swift or, or whoever it is, like these. Um, you know, we, we've all sort of figured out a way to, to make money and sort of get by doing what we do musically, but there's a significant investment made by people who have a lot more power than we do in terms of like sort of figuring out, well, what demographic of people is going to allow us to sell the, the most music, right? And so um, like the screamo band market, like that's not it, right? And so that group sort of, you know, gets marginalized. Classical music nowadays, like, that's not it, right? Mm -hmm. But in the you know 30s and 40s, like jazz was it. Like that was you know you went out to like the hottest clubs. That's that's what was making music. And so I think a lot of times that like guilty pleasure is sort of like music that has in some way been marginalized for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. you know, so. Say one more thing. It's almost like see see I teach students of all ages and backgrounds. So you're bound to get little teenage girls to love Taylor Swift. So what am I gonna say? Like, I'm not gonna teach you that song. <laughs> no, you teach them the song. You gotta meet them where they are. You meet them, where, yeah, yeah, you meet them where they are. It's music, it's got, it's got a beginning, a middle, and an end, you know, and, and some stuff you happy at the at the end of it, <laughs> no. but 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 you but but 
but you 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 treat all of it for that moment that you have to teach it i find i've found that you have to treat it with the respect that you that you that you extend to your student you know so you have to respect what they uh what 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 moves them you know towards music and um and 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 you have to offer them your love of music you know I want to thank you all for uh, very intelligent answers to a very glib question. That's what I was hoping for. Uh, yeah, so uh, save your applause, because we're, we're going to take a couple of minutes. Let me just double check the time here. We'll go till about 8.30 here. So that means we get about 15 minutes here. Uh, and let me turn it over to you guys. Um, you have gotten to know the folks on the stage a little bit about uh, uh, the kind of music they make, about uh, the kind of work they do, about what uh, compels them. Uh, what, what are the thoughts and questions you're bringing to the, the conversation here this evening? First of all, I have to say this is probably one of the best evenings I've had. Um, you have certainly opened my eyes and I'm probably one of those classical music who has to hear the world's most beautiful <laughs> classical songs, which was an album when I grew up. And that's the only reason I knew any classical music. But I do want to ask one question about the truck. When you go somewhere and you just open up and then it's just a free concert for anybody who's sitting there, or how does it work? Um, so our, our business model is very complicated. <laughs> there are a lot of concerts that that work that way. Um, we also do some gigs for hire as well. Um, some of these concerts are sponsored by an organization like, for example, the Minnesota Public Radio one. They sponsored that so that we could give free concerts um, to, to people who are just sitting there. Um, we have not investigated a ticket model yet, but that is something that we, we may consider. But for the most part, yeah, th they, they basically look like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. They're, they're yeah. great YouTube videos of the, of yeah, there, the, the there concert truck videos. as well. I don't, I'm not sure if they're on YouTube, but definitely on Facebook um, and, and Instagram. Oh, yeah, that's right. So we, we uh, just had a feature done in The Voice of America, um, and uh, they, they followed us around in our most recent gig at the University Farmers Market, and they did a, a short feature at um, so you can get kind of some behind the scenes footage of how we how we set the the concert up. Yeah. Uh, number one, I love this panel. It hits my whole life. I grew up in the Berkshires, and Yo Yo Ma was my first crush. <laughs> and I used to sneak on the campus of Tanglewood and watch Leonard Bernstein conduct. And then my father taught me jazz. And wow. then um, as I began participating in the artist scene here in Baltimore, uh, running a building called The Load of Fun, mm. and uh, meeting people and being involved in the community, meeting Wendell, I became involved in listening to uh, the Boom Bap Society mm -hmm. and really enjoying seeing all of my music friends that I have photographed and worked with um, participate in the Boom Bap Society, Wendell is one of my heroes. He doesn't know this um, because I am a <laughs> photographer, I am a singer. And so my question, and I asked a similar question at an artist talk last week is um, a lot of people ask, um, a lot of people ask, uh, how do you balance? Mm -hmm. And so my question as an artist is opposite. How do you zone in to create, to, to really focus on your creative space. Like I'm a, I'm a sandwich, I'm part of the sandwich generation. So I have a child and I have an elderly parent. And then I have creative friends who are always pushing me like, you have to go photograph. You need to come out and perform. You need to create. When are we seeing your next work? And so I'm trying to get back to that younger photographer who just had film and orange juice mm -hmm. in her refrigerator. And I yeah. was hyper focused. Um, so that's my question. How do you push out to really zone in a, in your creative space? Because we all have lives, we all have people in our lives, but I'm trying to go back to that younger artist who, you know, would spend 10 hours in the 
dark room and really just create, create, and create. Do you want to? I think. So, so that's a really great question. Um, so I, I think it's important to, uh, you know, people talk about priorities, um, and I think the way that people talk about priorities, they often say like, well, if something is, sort of by definition, if something is a priority, that means that the things, other things are less of a priority. And I don't really think of it that way, right? Like, I think it's all intertwined, but I do think, um, you know, one thing that, uh, somebody told me when I was a lot younger was that like whatever you spend the most time doing is what you are right and so um, you know there you know we all know or have known someone that says like oh I'm a you know such and such but they they never actually spend time doing that right now that doesn't mean that they didn't at some point but um, I remember when I first left uh, music school and um, you know my first job was uh, um, a very prestigious music job uh, folding sweaters at Abercrombie and Fitch. <laughs> and, um, you know, like that was my first job when I first moved here. But, uh, you know, I'd have my little four hour shift or whatever, and then I'd go home and I'd spend like six, seven, eight hours like at the piano or, or making music, right? And so, like, it didn't, again, it didn't matter what else I was doing as long as that's what I spent the most time doing. Um, and I think from, from that time, like, I just sort of like developed this ability to just like, focus on whatever was in front of me. Um, but now that I do like a lot of different things creatively, um, I th you know, a couple of things that help. One, uh, you know, I, I have structured my life so that my living space is my workspace, so I don't have to travel very far. Obviously, you know, if I'm taking photographs, I may have to go somewhere, but um, it's very important for me to make sure that that workspace is clean and I don't have a lot of distractions. Um, also, you know, nowadays with technology, like so much of what we do is on a computer or on a phone where you can easily just like, you know, turn, I could turn my, uh, you know, programming software, I could just put it on the other screen and like Facebook's right over there or now you can watch, you know, Netflix or Sling, you know, like just turn all that stuff off. Turn your Wi-Fi connection off if you can um, so that you have like just what you need in front of you. Um, and like I said at the very beginning, I said I've, I've taken two naps. Those naps aren't just because I was tired. It's because it literally allows me to like sort of step away briefly, clear my head, and then like go back in with laser focus. Um, so sometimes I'll take a walk with my dog or um, you know, just something that'll clear my mind. But um, just like, you know, have a, a, a goal um, to complete something by a certain amount of time for all of us. You know, we all are basically, as Aaron said, like independent business people. And so when, you, when you're not working with a team, it's hard sometimes to like set that and know you have to finish something by a certain amount of time, um, and you know maybe be a little bit gentle with yourself if you don't do that. But um, yeah, and I think once you get used to sort of focusing that way, um, you you know that whatever sort of fatigue um, comes with that, it's it's just sort of um, par for the course, and you just make sure that you take care of yourself uh, in between. Um, and you know, ha make sure you spend time with your creative friends. Ask them what they're doing. I, I get inspired. You know, I mean, like you know, Lafayette and I have worked together. Uh, I met Susan recently, but very inspired by the work that she's doing. And you know, you you, you go to shows and you make sure you, you know, that makes you want to go home and and you know, refocus even more. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Gosh, that that is the question. I I really feel that struggle is very real. Um, uh, yeah, so in between like teaching and working on concert trek, I, I always feel like if I don't have that space that is just mine to create, then I'm unhappy. It doesn't matter how well everything else is going or if I'm making money even. Um, so uh, everything that Wendell said I think is really great. I actually sometimes prefer having a workspace away from home um, just so that I know that I'm going someplace to work. Like that is... That is the goal of what is happening right now. Um, uh, I've also found just to get in the zone, uh, I started meditating recently, and that is really helpful. Um, so I, I noticed that when things are busy, your mind just moves very quickly, and um, time passes by so fast, and you just feel like you can't hold on. So if you give yourself just five or 10 minutes of just quiet where you can, um, S sort of monitor your thoughts and not let them dictate 
what you're about to do, um, it, it really helps with the focus, I think. Um, and as far as getting childlike, uh, that's something, I, I was just thinking about that this morning, actually. Um, I think that, that having that childlike love for what you do is hard when you do it professionally because you have so many other things attached to it. And it's um, and that kind of love, I think, is something that can kind of come and go, <laughs> or that feeling, right? Um, so being able to sustain it, I, I don't think it is actually possible to sustain it all the time, but I think, um, and I, I think that if you're doing something professionally, you have to sort of do it whether you feel like doing it or not. Um, and so that's sort of part of our training. Um, but at the same time, I do think it is important to be able to access that. And I, I tend to do that by doing what Wendell was saying, going to shows, being inspired by other musicians, being inspired by other art forms. Uh, watching a really great movie can even sometimes do it. Um, so basically being able to have the space to, to receive as well as create. Um, and, and finally, I would say something that I learned this past year is how to say no to things. That is really hard. And I always feel like I can't, you know? Um, like, I, I have to do this. I'm obligated to do this. But sometimes you, you sort of trick yourself into thinking that you have to do something that you really don't. Um, and I, I don't know your particular situation, but I did find some places where I could cut the fat and when it really came down to it, you know, uh, when there was enough pressure, I, I, I did say no to some people. So um, that, that would be my advice. Questions? All right, we've got time for one more question. Uh, okay, go ahead. Two more? Okay. Quick questions and uh, pithy answers. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, make sure to get as many voices as possible included. Go ahead. Okay, this is for any of you. Um, anyone? Yeah, you're on. Hard of you. Um, <laughs> any of you have any specific aspiration that you haven't yet met, but back in your mind someplace that you would like to do or experience in your art form or another art form? Um, uh, no, but also yes. Uh, no, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, uh, when I was younger, like I had sort of a very clear idea of like, um, not just career-wise, but in life, but about like what I wanted and like what I, where I thought I'd be at thirty and uh, and at forty. And um, honestly, like it hasn't turned out at all how I expected. And I say that in the, like in the most positive way. And um, I think a large part of that is the fact that the world now. Um, so I I just turned uh, forty-five. So the world now is like vastly different from how it was when I was graduating from school in ways that I couldn't have possibly imagined. Like um, a lot of what I do professionally would not have been possible 20 years ago, the way technology um, is, it was like, um, and so, and, and I'm constantly amazed at what it is that I'm doing now. Um, and, and like, it, I, I just feel so, so fortunate. And I feel as though the moment that I let go of sort of like that idea of like, this is what has to happen, um, which, you know, in part, was forced upon me when I had that um, that physical um, sort of setback. The moment I let go of that, like my career and life just really sort of started to blossom. And so what I'm trying to do um, is just stay as true as I can to um, sort of, you know, like my present artistic goal and then um, seeing, like I have ideas about what I want to do like in a year or two and um, sort of working towards that, but also being open to whatever comes along um, during that period of time. And hope, you know, I hope that in another five years or 10 years, just like in the last five or 10, that I'm in a, a completely different place that I could never have um, imagined, but that's still um, fulfilling and rewarding and, you know, making me feel like really challenged and, you know, sometimes stressed, but in a really good way. Um, so that's what I mean when I say uh, yes and no. Yeah, that's all very, very true. I can say that, that that's very true for me as well. And I think, um, especially as a musician, I think some other professions, there's a, a more clear path for how things are supposed to go. But um, 
with music, there there are some paths, but a lot of times you're you're mostly just ad adjusting and adapting to your your surroundings. Um, for me, I'm I'm just fresh out of school, so there's actually a lot that I want to explore. It's a little bit scary, but um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to explore improvisation and composition and doing things in other genres, and as well as uh, exploring new repertoire within my own genre. Um, so I'm I'm really excited to see where all of that leads. Um, yeah, I'd like to um, I'd like to do uh, have more opportunities to write and, and score. Um, and score, uh, film, television, uh, plays, dramas. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to. I'd like to to, to 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 travel more. I mean, I've already been blessed to, to, to travel all over the world, but I'd like to do more of that and continue to meet people and continue to form relationships and um, and. Um, just um just continue to make the uh the best music that um that we can make um given the situations that uh various situations that we have last question <laughs> all right someone's abdicating their question yeah okay Was the holy grail for you in the beginning getting a record deal or a record of some sort, and has that changed over time, or have you discovered the independent route for yourselves? Um, I feel like for classical musicians, a lot of it is winning like a major competition or something. With a lot of that has you know a record deal in in that. Um, it's very very competitive. <laughs> Uh, best of the best in the world. So um, I I still have some interest in that, actually. I, I still have a little bit of time to do it. Uh, more so just because I, I think that kind of competition really pushes you. Uh, you draw some kind something out of you. It's almost like a survival mode. But at the same time, um, I, I have a very different perspective on what a piano competition means um, because it doesn't necessarily guarantee a career if you win, and also because how do you how do you compare people's artistry? You know that's that's tricky, and that um, in a competition it's being determined by a panel, um, and of course very esteemed panel who who's uh, who who's very respected and who has great judgment, but. Um, uh, I almost feel like the real competition happens after the competition when it's in the real world. So that's um, how my perspective has changed. Um, so for me, when I first started producing electronic music and hip hop, um, I definitely thought like, oh, I gotta get a record deal. And I remember um, printing up these really nice packages and putting t these little demo CDs and um, sending them out to all of these, you know, these labels. But um, it, it's almost humorous to me now because like what I put in there, none of the, they weren't even finished songs. It was just like ideas and I was hoping like a label would be like, wow, he's got great ideas. Like we should hire him to like develop his ideas. And um, and it wasn't until later that I just like realized that it just doesn't really work that way. Um, and a lot of people that I knew that were signed to, you know, labels that were sort of putting out music like that um, ended up in these really bad situations where they were under contract for multiple records and that, weren't actually paying them any money and they couldn't get out of them. And um, so I'm really wary of that. Also, um, at some point when I did start to get attention from these labels, they'd say things like, wow, like, you know, you're really good, but um, you know, you should really maybe just focus on one thing, like just do hip hop and not jazz or just do like, um, you know, drum and bass, but not hip hop. And I was just like, I, d I didn't really want to do that. Um, and in fact, what sort of jump started my career was when I put out um, three albums on the same day uh, back in 2014, and they were three, you know, totally different albums, because um, I could, because I didn't have anybody telling me what to do, um, and uh, so uh, now I, I I don't really have any aspirations of of, th of that at all, um, and in some ways I'm glad that that uh, that that didn't happen that way. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm I I thought it was the, yeah I thought. Uh, if I get a record deal, 
then everything will magically appear, you know, you get the gigs, you get the the right musicians to play your stuff and the, the whole the whole thing. Um I was fortunate because I never got that. Uh what I got was uh distribution deals. So, um and that allowed uh my music to to get out there and even though there was uh very little money I involved um uh that that uh was better than signing a record deal i think i think i probably would if i had signed one i probably would have been buried you know m more work probably would have been buried because uh they they wouldn't have had a i i can't see where they would have had an immediate like market niche they could like plug it into you know that i i needed i needed work in that department so it was then um uh now because the industry has fundamentally changed a, a, a record deal would be like the last thing i would want did you see that they just announced that now the new length for an album is like 15 minutes 15 or, 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 minutes? or five songs yeah like oh a yeah? full length album yeah that's it's been all over Facebook. Like um, Black Thought just came out with an album, and it's, it's like they just changed the the limitations. So like a full length album is now can be like uh, technology is evolving or, and or attention five. spans are decreasing. Yeah. 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 All right. We didn't even right. talk about technology. All right, stay tuned for part two next season, maybe. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Wendell Patrick, Susan Zhang, and Lafayette Gilchrist, and a round of applause for yourself. Thank you guys for being here, for your questions, and for your attention. And I just want to say thank you. Let's give him a round of applause again. This was just such a wonderful presentation. Really enjoyed it. Um, I want to thank you for coming out this evening, for coming to our Great Talk event. Uh, this was our final uh, event for this year, but stay tuned for next season. We have some really great ideas in the pipeline and um, look forward to seeing you and your friends. I want to thank Morgan State University for hosting us. I mean, it, this this room was wonderful. Greg, thank you, and for your volunteers that also helped out tonight. Um, and I want to invite you all for refreshments. And uh, thank you again for coming out. Good night. <laughs>